reminder that we're entering into the Advent season, and every year we produce an Advent guide with scripture readings in it. I'm excited about a couple of things. One is, last year we had a church contact us and ask us if they could have it for them to use at their church, and so we shared that last year and this year. And then this year, we had a, um, one of our missionaries from Asia contact us and want us to know if we could send it to them so that they could use it out there. And so um, next year, Joy, next year, let's put on here international. <laughs> we might, that's right, we might have to copyright it or something. <laughs> A heart of thanksgiving. I want us to turn our, our thoughts to thanksgiving today. I mentioned to you that, that in the Advent season I'm going to be preaching mostly out of the book of Isaiah. And I want to give you an understanding of Isaiah's prophecies concerning Messiah and what was going on in Isaiah's day. But for today, I still want to stay in the book of John and chapter 16 where we have been. And every year at Thanksgiving time, I, I like to turn my my thoughts toward thanksgiving. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits, how easy it is for us sometimes to forget the benefits of God in our lives. And you know, when we just look outside and we see creation, God's creative act, it causes us, or ought to cause us, to bow our heads and give thanks for a God of glory. The heavens declare the glory of God. Space shows the mighty work of His hands. And God is a wonderful God, has blessed us with so many things. And so I would like for us to, not, um, to go beyond just the observation of thanksgiving and and, and actually give thanks uh, to the Lord for the many things that He has done for us. Um, Thanksgiving began, you know, there's lots of different records of how Thanksgiving began, but a lot of times we trace Thanksgiving in America back to, to um, the 1621, actually. And it really wasn't the first Thanksgiving, but we look back at it and call it the first Thanksgiving. So it kind of gets that notoriety. In November 11th of 1620, 102 people left, set sail from England on the Mayflower. 35 of them were an original group of Puritans, and Puritans were very <coughs> religious people. And the Puritans actually have a history of Thanksgiving, but to the Puritans, Thanksgiving was not a feast celebration, it was fasting and prayer. Um, some of us, myself included, I think, could probably benefit much better from a day of fasting than a day of feasting. But for the Puritans, their thanksgiving was when they came to God in fasting and in prayer. Um, as they came to, to the new country, it was a hard time for, for many of them. About half of them, about 49, I think it was, died in the very first year, the survivors managed to build in that first year that they were in the Americas, in the New World, to, they built seven houses that, um, that cared for the rest of them. And the first Thanksgiving, while well, it didn't occur until 1623, but in October of 1621, the 53 surviving pilgrims and about native, uh, 90 Native Americans celebrated a, a harvest festival. It was a glorious time for those 53 survivors because they had survived. Um, oftentimes when, when I think about this and I think, what is it that I'm thankful for? I'm thankful for so many things that they didn't even know. They couldn't even dream were going to come into being. They were just thankful to God. They were just thankful for life itself. They sat down at a meal, and they didn't have turkey, but they did have ducks and geese, because ducks and geese were easy to, to get. And along with that, and here's where I'm really jealous of, of those Puritans, they had lobster Amen. and clams and mussels. I love, I love seafood. 
And that's what they enjoyed because they were right there on the Hudson and it was easy to obtain seafood food, and seafood was in abundance. In addition to that, the Indian folk that joined them, the Native Americans, brought along five deer to share with them. So they had some venison as well. They had collected nuts from the forest, and there were chestnuts, and there were walnuts, and they had learned to grow some crops from the Indians, including squash and carrots and peas. And on that, they feasted and they gave thanks. They were thankful, I believe, for some of the most basic things in life. They were thankful to God. They were thankful that God had allowed them to survive. They were thankful for life because so many of them that had come with them had died. They were thankful for their very first harvest, as small as it was. They were thankful for their Native American friends. They were thankful for some very real, sincere, genuine things. And as I thought about that this week, I thought, you know, what, what is it? If I was going to list, and it's impossible to do, if I was going to list my top ten, or list important things for which I give thanks, what would be on my list? You see, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, in everything, give thanks. Sometimes that can be a little bit troubling because of the word everything. It doesn't say in every good thing. It doesn't say in everything that pleases my eyes or pleases my, my taste. It says in everything, give thanks. So, what is it that I am most thankful for? Well, i got to tell you this morning, the number one thing that I'm thankful for is my faith. I am thankful that I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and that He has a future ordained for me. I am thankful that my Lord has gone to His Father's house, where there are many rooms, that He has gone to prepare, prepare a place for me, that where He is, I may be with Him forever. I'm thankful for my faith. I'm thankful for the Word of God. The Word of God is so fun to me. It's so enjoyable to me. I just love the Word of God. I love studying it. I love getting into it. All of it. Old Testament and New Testament. I'm thankful that God has revealed Himself to me through the Word of God. I'm thankful for creation. I love a mountain. I love a valley. I love a stream. I love a river. I love looking at snow on the news. <laughs> I love not living in Alexandria, Minnesota. <laughs> but I love people that live in Alexandria. No people up there, actually. Um, God created the seasons, and for that I am thankful. He created a beautiful globe, Earth, on which we live. And every part of it, the rocks and the hills, the bugs, the birds, all of it, is God's divine creation, and I'm thankful for the place that God has given me for now to call home. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for my church. I'm thankful for the people of my church. I know that many of the people of our church, of our family, are traveling this weekend, and will be traveling next weekend. All of our youth are gone um, off to their annual beach trip, and, and I'm thankful that they made it safely in our old bus. And I'm praying that they'll make it safely back in our old bus as well. But I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for each and every one of you. And every single day when I walk, when I drive up to the church and I walk in here, I pause and I give thanks for our church family, for every one of you, um, for your encouragement and your support and your participation in Fellowship Bible Church. I'm thankful for my health. I'm pretty healthy, above my knees. I'm not, not all that healthy for my knees down, okay, but I get along just fine. I am thankful for health, and health is not something to be taken for granted. Uh, God is, has been good to me, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for problems. I was thinking about my list, and I thought, I have to put problems on there. You know, if there weren't any problems, I'm not sure I'd be thankful for anything at all. Because it's my problems that really <clears throat> drive me to the Lord that drive me to my knees, that drive me to the Word, that drive me to trust. I'm thankful that the Lord brings those things into my life. 
to cause me to stop and think and reflect and turn to Him. I'm thankful for my children. I'm going to see a bunch of them this week. Three of my four sons, three of my four daughters-in-law, 11 of the grandchildren. Um, between us, we have six kids and 22 grandchildren, and I'm thankful for our family. I'm thankful that, that, that we have a family that walks with Jesus, that loves God. I'm thankful that not only the children, but the children's children um, are, are people that love the Lord. I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful for joy. I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for encouragement, her encouragement. I'm thankful for her prayer support. I'm thankful that, that um, together we make a team, that God put us together, that we are one. We are one. That we represent the relationship between Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. That we are a picture of our glorious union with him forever and ever. I'm thankful for prayer. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I'm thankful I can talk to God. I can talk to God. I mean, think about that. I can talk to God. See, I can't, I can't talk to the senator of Texas. I can't talk to the president of the United States. I can't talk to other important dignitaries. If I call up, they don't answer. If I call up Angela Merkel in, in Germany, they're, they're not going to say, Angela Russell, Pastor Russell from Fellowships on the Phone. I can talk to God. I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful that God's in control. Yeah, I live in a world where God is in control. So John 16, our passage that we have before us this morning, as I was thinking about it over the last weeks, and knowing that I was going to end just before the Advent season with this, and wondering exactly what to do with it, as I got meditating upon the passage, I got thinking about the things that are contained in this passage to be thankful for. There's many of them, and I'm going to encourage you to take John 16 and take it home with you this week and sit down and open your Bible and start with chapter 1 and just think about all the things that are in this chapter that, that Jesus, as he's talking to his disciples just hours before his arrest and crucifixion, things for which they can be thankful. But John, in my passage today, I, I just want to take three of them, okay? Number one, I'm thankful for God's love. Number two, I'm thankful for prayer. And number three, I'm thankful for the hope that I have in Christ Jesus. And as we think about this today, I want to set our hearts in the direction of thanksgiving. That this week might not be a week of feasting, but a week of celebrating who God is in our lives. Would you stand together with me as we read our scripture? John chapter 16, verses 23 to 33. It says, in that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, and by the way, we haven't heard from them in a couple of chapters now because everything they've said was kind of a foot and mouth thing. And now they're right back at the foot and mouth thing, by the way. And the disciple said, now you're speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Jesus said, oh, you believe in me. At last. Jesus answered, but a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered each to his own home 
You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone. For my Father is with me. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Heavenly Father, as we now pause to consider your word and hear from you, I pray that you would fill our hearts with thanksgiving, not because it's a holiday in our country, but because you've called us to be a thankful people, to give praise, to worship you, our God. Oh, how much we have to be thankful for. Oh, how much to celebrate. Oh, how much to praise you for. Bless our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. May be seated. So three things I want to talk about. Number one, I'm thankful for God's love. The Father loves you. That's what Jesus says right here in our text. The Father loves you. You know, it's so simple. It's so simple. And yet, verse 27, the Father himself loves you. God loves you. The God of all creation, almighty, omnipotent, omniscient, all-powerful God loves you. Loves you. It's an amazing truth. So simple in the way it's presented. And yet, it's an amazing truth. The Father loves you. You know, there's several Greek words. You've all heard this that are translated love. And actually, there's only two Greek words in the Bible that are translated love. Um, phileo and agape are the only two words translated love in the Bible. Now, there are other words translated love, like eros, which is more of a sexual thing, uh, stergos, which is more of a love for football um, kind of thing, okay? None, those aren't, they didn't have football in the Bible, so they didn't use that word. And there's a couple of other um, Greek words as well. It's about six that are all translated love, but in the Bible there's only two. Agape is love of the will, okay? It's one of the rarest words in ancient Greek literature. You don't run into it outside of the Bible very often in ancient Greek literature. The reason is because the Greeks, apart from God manifesting himself in the person of Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin, come to earth as the Savior of mankind, the Greeks couldn't understand this kind of love. To the Greeks, the agape love was the love that, uh, that occurred within their pantheon of gods, and while it was common for a god to agape another god in their mythology, the concept of God agape a human being was certainly outside of their understanding and outside of their belief system. And so it was the New Testament writers, it was Jesus and then the New Testament writers that popularized the use and the understanding of the Greek word agape, um, a love of the will. Um, I will my love for you. You know, the fact of the matter is, husbands and wives, when you consider each other, there are things that you do that aren't all that lovely. And, and yet, we, when, when we make a commitment, till death us do part, we are making a decision of our will to love and not stop. It's a will action. It's a will decision. And God has that kind of love for you. God wills to love you, and God will not stop loving you. It's self-giving love, agape is. Love that demands something of me. Love that is more concerned with giving than receiving. That's why in John 3.16, as simple as that verse and as common as that verse is, it is profound to us. Because it says, God so loved the whole world that he gave his only son. You see, God doesn't love only those that respond to him. That's more my kind of love. I'll love you if you'll love me back. If you love me back, we can have a great relationship, okay? But it's hard for me to love you 
when you're stabbing me in the back and calling me all kinds of names and being cruel and whatever it is. But God's love, agape love, is love that demands absolutely nothing in return. God loved the world and gave his son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Now one needs to recognize God's love and receive God's love in order to believe that Jesus is their Savior. But God unconditionally gave his son to all the world. Giving, not receiving. John 15, 17. Our love for each other. This is my command. Love each other. You see, that's the way God wants us to love. Our love for each other is to be a godly love within the body of Christ. A giving love, not a receiving love. A love of the will, not a love of the emotion. That's agape. Phileo is more a love of emotion. Now, we all, we, we all know that like Philadelphia's uh, Adelphos is the Greek word for brother. Phileo is the Greek word for love. So Philadelphia, Phileo Adelphos is brotherly love. But, you know, it, that, that falls far short of what Phileo means. In fact, there's something I want you to understand about Phileo. Phileo is not an inferior kind of love next to agape. That's a wrong understanding, <laughs> that like agape love is up here and phileo love is a step down. No, 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 not at all. They are two separate yet distinct kinds of love. Um, it's a different expression of love is all it is. Phileo is the deep love of caring affection. It's the love of emotion. God made us to be emotional beings. Emotions are good. Emotions are right. Now emotions can get out of hand. Okay, Everything in life um, can be misused and abused. But emotions are a very, very important thing. I have deep emotional love for my wife. I have deep emotional love for my children. I have deep emotional love for my grandchildren. I have deep emotional love for certain friends, especially that are very, very close friends and have been close friends all of my life. Phileo love is a very important kind of love. It describes the love of parents for their children. It describes the kind of love of children for their parents. Many years ago now, I lost both of my parents in two separate times to old age and death. I only lost them temporarily. I'm going to find them soon. I mean, not too soon, <laughs> but one day I'm going to be rejoined with them in heaven, okay? I have pictures of my mom and my dad that I cherish because I love them. I love them with all of my heart. That's a filet of love. It's an emotion. I don't have at this point in life the opportunity to be self-sacrificing for them because they're gone. But I certainly have the capacity to have a phileo emotional love for them and never forget them and never stop honoring them and never stop being thankful and grateful for them and the difference in the influence that they made in my life. Phileo describes that kind of love. It's the love of best friends for each other. It's the expression of equality. You see, in phileo love, one is not lower or less significant than the other. Phileo love is an equalizer. It realizes that we're both important. I love you. You love me. It's a relational, emotional love. But, and I use the word fatherly up here cautiously, because I'm in reference to God now. But it expresses a special fatherly love. Sometimes it's easier to talk about phileo emotional love being motherly, because more people had good mothers than maybe had good fathers. And if you didn't have a good father, and then I say, and phileo love expresses, expresses, expresses a special fatherly love, and your memories of your dad, who maybe was 
cranky and angry and an alcoholic and no good and all kinds of different things, you say, well, I don't like, I don't like that kind of love at all. I'm not talking about fallen love like that. I'm talking about as God intended it to be. You see, God is not like the Father we had. God is like the Father He wanted us to have. God is like the Father He created humankind to be. God is the perfect Father. He's the unfallen Father. And what I want you to understand is, if phileo love is an emotional love, I want you to understand that God has a deep emotional love for you. For you. God. God isn't a way out there disconnected God. God is a God who gazes into your heart and soul, who looks at you and knows everything there is to know about you, all the good things and all the faults that you have, and God gazes upon you and says, Ah, my beloved son, my beloved daughter, I fillet, oh, my son. I fillet, oh, my daughter. <coughs> See, as I look back over the years, my kids are in their 40s. As I look back over the years, they didn't always do everything I wanted them to do. And sometimes I was disappointed in the decisions that they made. But I was never disappointed with the fact that they were my sons. I was never disappointed with the fact that I and their mother gave birth, gave life to them. I never didn't care. I never stopped loving. And that's the way God is with you and me. God isn't always pleased with every decision that we make. God isn't pleased with every thought that goes through our mind. God isn't pleased with every action that we take. But you're still God's child. And God still has an agape love, perfect and pure, but he still has phileo love, an emotional love for you as a perfect father for his imperfect children. The psalmist wrote, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good. His love endures forever and forever and forever. It's repeated four times in Psalm 118, 1 to 4. Because the psalmist wants us to get it. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love for you endures forever, 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 forever. It's the emphasis of the Hebrew. Forever, I think, gives five assurances of a father's love. Number one, it's a love that never gives out. It's a love that never gives out. God, our Father, never comes to a point where he says... I've had enough. Now I know I'm not the only dad that came to that point for a time or two in my life. I've had enough. Not God. God's love never gives out. It never wears down. I know as a child, boy, I could wear my parents out. I could wear them down. When I was a boy, I wanted a pony. And I didn't know what no meant. And I told everybody I knew I was getting a pony. And pretty soon everybody I knew was telling their moms I was getting a pony. And then pretty soon their moms was telling my mom, I heard that you're getting Russell a pony. I'll never forget that talk. <laughs> God's love never wears down. He never gets tired of you. He never gets put out with you. He never gets fed up and sick of you. No, God loves you forever. He never grows cold. God never comes to a point where he says, you know, there was a time when I really fell in love with you, but I just don't feel that anymore. No. No. God's love never grows cold, and it never grows distant. And it's never inaccessible. 
Our Father loves us. In this week of Thanksgiving, folks, be thankful for the love of God. It's amazing. Let me give you a couple examples of phileo love in the scripture because we don't talk about God's love as phileo love very often. So I'm going to give a couple of brief examples, okay? Number one, at the tomb of Lazarus, you remember the, you remember the uh, count? Lazarus has died. Word comes to Jesus that Lazarus is sick and then that he has died and Jesus waits four days before he arrives at the tomb. The disciples are quite troubled why Jesus would wait so long instead of rushing to the rescue for this friend of his. When Jesus does arrive in Bethany, where Lazarus has now been placed in the tomb, he has two sisters, Mary and Martha, and they come out scolding Jesus. Had you been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And the Bible tells us that Jesus came to the tomb and wept. And you want to know what the observation of the people was that day? See how he phileo, phileoed him? Jesus phileoed Lazarus. Not agape. Phileoed. A deep, emotional, caring love. How about another one? The church in Laodicea. The church in Laodicea has a bad name, doesn't it? It's kind of like the liberal church down the block. You know, there's a bunch of good church, good churches, and then we come to the United Laodicean Church. They're liberal. Well, John is writing to the seven churches of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Laodicea is the last one. It's the church that basically says, I, I don't really have anything good to say about you guys. I wish you were hot, or I wish you were cold. I wish you were like hot water, or I wish you were like cold, refreshing water, but you're not either one of those. You're not good for coffee. You're not good for cooling down, cooling off, refreshment. You're just lukewarm. And Jesus speaks to the church and says, those whom I phileo, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Jesus speaks to the church at Laodicea and says, I have deep-seated emotional love for you. That's why I rebuke and discipline you. You see, the fact of the matter is, and I've often said this, church discipline is a matter of love. It's a matter of love. The only reason the elders of this church or any church ever bring discipline onto a person is because we love them. Amen. We care about them. Amen. We want them to repent. We want them to do the right thing. If we didn't care, we wouldn't care. If God didn't care about us. He wouldn't rebuke us. He wouldn't discipline us. It's phileo love. Here's my point. Phileo is family love. My Heavenly Father has a deep, emotional, compassionate love for you and for me that a parent has for his child, which means I'm a member of the family. I'm a member of the family. I'm a member of the family. Thanksgiving is Certainly one of my favorite times of the year. During the many years I lived in Alaska, our Thanksgiving was like the Walton's Thanksgiving. We had this huge table and the ends would pull out and it got even bigger. And we had certain friends that became family members. I think all of them are dead now. My boys would sit around the table, my wife and I, and then we had these friends. And they were part of us. They were part of everything we did. They knew, they, they knew everything we knew. They were in on our conversations. They were an intimate part of our family. They were special to us. They were important to us. We loved them. They've all died. I remember crying every time one of them died. Because it was a great, great loss as a family member to me. They were members of our family. I'm a member of God's family. 
you're a member of God's family. That's the message Jesus is giving us. He wants us to remember and never forget and be thankful. God is your Father. He loves you. The second thing I'm thankful for is prayer. What a precious promise Jesus gives here, okay? In John 16, 23 and 24, our text, he says, In that day when the Holy Spirit comes, I put in the Holy Spirit comes. That's what he's talking about. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, or verily, verily, or truly, truly, um, depending on your translation, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. So joy, J J Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, you can ask, and God will hear and grant your request. Verse 26, in that day you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. There's a deep theological truth here, folks. And it is that we, in prayer, can go to our Father, and we need not fear going to our Father. Jesus talked about in John 15, whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give it. And in John 14, 13 and 14, I'll do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. You see, Jesus is telling us that we have access to the very presence of God. We have access. We're not only loved by Him, we get to talk to Him. We get to bring our needs to Him. We get to bring our requests to Him. This is absolutely mind-blowing in my opinion when I think that I, just little me, a tiny speck in a universe that's maybe 93 trillion light years across. And I'm so tiny. I'm not even a dot. But God loves me. And God says, you can ask anything in my name. Now, I've got to tell you something. One of the horrendous falsehoods of vast parts of the church is that we don't go directly to God. We have to go somewhere else. And then that person goes to God. See, that's, that's a falsehood on various different parts of the church. They teach that the Father God is indifferent and harsh. He's a God of judgment. That Jesus is committed to justice and judgment and therefore he's busy doing other things. And that Mary and the angels and the saints are compassionate and sensitive to our needs. And thus, it's Mary and the angels and the saints that await our appeal to them so that they can go to the Father on our behalf. Some of you come out of that kind of a Christian church background. Pray to the saints. Pray to Mary. That's not what Jesus is saying. I've got to tell you, if that's true, the Bible isn't. Now I'm going to get technical. So don't get up and walk out on me here. But in verse 23, in the New International Version, it says, In that day you will no longer ask me anything. We're living in that day. You will no longer ask me anything. I mentioned to you last week, we don't pray to the Holy Spirit. We pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, in that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you, who will? My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Now, there are people that teach, yes, the Father will give you whatever you ask, but you still need to take your prayer through Mary or an angel or a saint or somebody else. So let's look at it. Who do we pray to? Now here's where I want you to hang on. Don't walk out. There's the verse. Forgive me, but that's the verse. That's the verse in Greek. Now let me help you out here. There's the interliterary English. In that day, you will ask nothing of me not. Now in the English, a double negative is a positive, right? A double negative is a positive. Um, you ain't got nothing. Well, if you ain't got nothing, you have something. Because you ain't got nothing. Okay? But in, in the Greek, in the Greek, a double negative is an emphasis. It wants us to understand. In that day you will ask nothing of me not. You're not going to talk, you're not going to bring your prayers to me. You're not going to bring your requests to me. 
True, true, I say to you, anything, whatever you ask the Father, you ask the Father, in the name of me, he will give you. You ask the Father. In the Greek, those two words are the same. They're just different tenses. The first one at the top in that day, you will ask, is future tense. But the second one, anything, whatever you ask is errorist, which means there's no time related to it. It's always good. It's always true. It's always the fact. You ask. And then the word, the word means you ask for yourself. You're talking for yourself. You're praying to the Father for yourself. So the question becomes, who's praying? You are. Who are you praying to? The Father. How are you praying? In the name of Jesus. Who's the mediator? There isn't one. You have direct access. Amen. You have direct access. You don't have to go through some poorly English-speaking person in India. We've all had that experience, right? Dial 1-800-ASK-APPLE or whatever it is. Huh? No, I get to go straight to the Father. I have access. You have access to the ears of God. To the ears of God. Ephesians 3.12, in Him Christ and through faith in Him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I can go into the very throne room of God. I can go to God himself with my request. And I thank God. I thank God for the privilege of prayer. That he loves me, phileos me so much. That he says, come to me with your needs. See, if my father said to me, my earthly dad, if he said to me, Russell, you know, I really love you. I really love you. If you need anything from me, well, I'm going to send somebody up. You can talk to them. And then they'll bring it to me. That would be an insult to me. My earthly father allowed me to go directly to him face to face. So does my heavenly father, folks. So does our heavenly father access to God. I am thankful for God's filial love. I am thankful to God for prayer. And thirdly, I'm thankful to God for the hope he gives. Jesus writes, a, or says to, to the disciples on their way to Gethsemane, I have told you these things so that in me you might have peace. In this world you're going to have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Now you might wonder, well, why didn't you put up there, I'm thankful for the peace he gives? Because I think the peace leads to hope. Leads to a hope that I have in Christ Jesus. When you understand God's love, and you know that you have access to him, that relationship brings peace, despite the hostility of the world and the trouble that it brings. So just the night before Jesus spoke the words of verse 33, he had told the disciples, and we spent several weeks there, he had told the disciples about how much tribulation they would experience in this world. And we went through the history of the disciples looking at the tribulation and trouble and pain and suffering and turmoil that they went through. But in the midst of all of the trouble and suffering and pain and affliction of this world, I have peace and I have hope. And the reason I have peace is because I have hope. I have hope it's not going to last forever. I have hope for an eternity. I have hope for this, for the kingdom that I'm really a citizen of, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of eternal heaven. I hope for a better day. I hope for a greater day. Hope in the Greek is not like hope in the English. Hope in the English is hope so. Hope in the Greek is confident expectation. See, I have confident expectation that God has an eternal plan for me. So my confident expectation, my hope is sure. Because God's word is true. Because my salvation is secure. Because heaven is real. 
because our Savior has overcome this world. Amen. I'm thankful to God for hope. Have a hard Thanksgiving. Fill your heart with praise. Give thanks to the Lord for He's good. His love endures forever. Amen. Psalm 91, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. See, it doesn't just say give thanks to the Lord. Tell of his wonderful deeds. First Thessalonians, Paul wrote, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, Paul wrote, for everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. So I'm going to suggest to you that we don't celebrate Thanksgiving this week. I'm going to suggest to you we practice Thanksgiving. We practice Thanksgiving. Tell of all of his wonderful deeds. When you're reading your Bible, read your Bible with the thought, what in this passage can I give thanks for? Tell God, thank you. And tell others, thank you. In your prayer time, it's okay to bring your needs to the Lord, but bring your lips of praise to Him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Let me list them for you. As you join your family and friends on Thursday, what are you thankful for? Tell them. Tell them what you're thankful for. Tell your wife. Tell your husband. They're still alive if you're blessed and they're still alive. Tell your children. If your children are little, tell them why you're thankful for them. If your children are grown, tell them why you're thankful for them. If your children are believers, tell them why you're thankful for them. If your children are not believers, tell them why you're thankful for them. See, it doesn't change. Thank you for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. That one day this whole world will be left behind. But eternity and all the glory 
holiness and all the goodness and all the wonders await us forever and forever. Lord God, 